Hello, my name is David Ewan and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. We're located at 1060 Worcester Street in Springfield, Massachusetts, in the Indian Orchard area of Springfield. Join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TRC413 and subscribe to ResSense Spring at YouTube. Do you know your God-given identity? Well, if you asked me this question back in college or even at the start of my master's program way many years ago, I knew exactly who I was, so I thought. If I had described myself to you, I would have described myself as a type A perfectionist and a first class warrior of the world. I prided myself for needing to have everything absolutely perfect and when it wasn't, I worried the heck out of it. That's the way I was. And the best part of it, I attributed myself knowing all about myself as being self-aware. I was taught self-aware is all that mattered. It meant that I was in control. You see, the Holy Spirit was sleeping inside of me. It was locked up and I didn't know. I had no connection to God. I didn't even know who I was in Christ. I didn't know who God was. I was truly lost. Today's agenda is a list of eight items. The first one is testimony about identity and purpose in life. I'll share with you a uh, testimony. Number two, let God control your wiggle direction and pull you up. Number three, learn who Yahweh is. Number four, signs of unclear identity in life. Number five, what your God-given identity gives you. And number six, clues to your God-given identity. And number seven, God-given purpose in life. And number eight, how to let God be the pilot in your life. So let's begin. When I was a kid at the university, I took risks. And I took risks because I wanted to show myself that I was in control by being able to manage those dangerous risks. So think about it. I assume that training to handle these risks would put me into control. What happened was I joined the, Uni the UMass parachute team. I didn't tell my parents because I knew they would say no. I intentionally was disobedient. I also learned nothing can be kept a secret. I found that out later. So think about it. I was hiding my disobedience. It's never permanent. And I learned that the hard way. When it was time for me to jump, and in my first case, I didn't jump. <laughs> I didn't want to go. But when I, what I was more concerned about was my buddies who are watching me. And I didn't want them to see that I was afraid. I wanted them to see that I could do it. So think about my concern of what others think of me was more important. That's not identity. That's other people's perception of you. That was a problem that I had. Okay. Well, on this team that I joined for parachuting, I had ground training. I learned that we, what we prepared for was not the same as reality. So we kind of prepared sort of the motions on the ground, but what we actually did in the air is not the same as on the ground. We had great ground training, don't get me wrong, but the sky is not the same. See, on the ground, we live in a two-dimensional life, but in the air, it's three-dimensional. That's totally different. Stepping off a fixed landing gear while holding on the wing strut under the overtop wings. In the training, you're supposed to jump off. In reality, what you're supposed to do is not jump, but to step off. But because we were on the ground, the simulation of stepping off was jumping off. And then after you're off the aircraft and you're in the air, what you're supposed to do is your body is going forward because you're stepping off an airplane <laughs> that's in the air. You go into a hard arch like a bullet and you fly like a bullet 
at about 95, I, I said that wrong, 95 miles per hour into the wind. See, the, the small aircraft about uh, the size of a Cessna uh, was going about 95 miles per hour to slow down so that when we go into a hard arch that we're not going too fast. And then what happens is you deploy a chute with the ripcord. The chute opens and you go down. So what we used was what was called a T-10 parachute. And that's traditional with what you see in World War II. So first of all, I was using antiquated equipment. And, I and my life depended on this antiquated equipment. The rate of descent is about 22 to 24 feet per second. That's about 15 miles per hour. So you're going down in a steady clip. Um, with the toggles that you have on the parachute, there are these holes in the back where air is released. You can change direction. You can change direction or you can maintain a forward speed of five miles per hour. So if I'm going down 15 miles per hour and I got a forward speed of five miles per hour, this creates a, the zenith of an 18.4 degree angular vector resulting going at an angle like this about 15.8 miles per hour. In summary, you're falling out of the sky at about 15.8 15 .8 miles per hour, about 16 miles per hour. Well, I'll think of this. The only reason you need a parachute <laughs> is if you plan to use it twice. If you don't plan to use it twice, you don't need it the first time. Okay, other than that, the jump is all you need. Okay, so after the ground training, here was my first time in flight. We have five people in the aircraft, including the pilot and the trainer. So there's three jumpers, one supervisor and a pilot. So I was extremely scared with the buffeting noise. And the way I was positioned is my back, I was sitting on the floor where a seat used to be, and my back was facing towards a propeller. And to my right was the pilot as he was facing out the, the windshield looking at the forward view. And the side door was opened up like this. The wings are above the aircraft. So the side door goes open like this. And I'm supposed to reach out, put my foot out on the landing gear. That's a fixed landing gear and swing my body around. Well, what happened was the first time I put my hand out, it blew it back in. So it's pretty windy out there. So I almost didn't go, but I was more concerned about what others thought of me. I was scared. I can't put it to words. My self-approval was more important than anything else. Let me tell you, looking for self-approval, that's idolatry. But I didn't know it. My focus was on one thing, self-approval. So what happened was, as I'm standing, um, as I get out and I'm standing on the landing gear and I'm holding on to the wing strut like this. In training, what I'm supposed to do is step off and go into a hard arch and keep my eyes forward. That keeps the equilibrium in my ear balanced because I need to stay vertical. If I don't, I can black out and lose control and I will not pull the ripcord. So I need to be fully alert and wake. Well, what happened was as I told you before, the ground training and uh, what happens in reality in the air is not the same. So on the ground, what I did was I, I sort of jumped off to simulate stepping off. Well, I found out why you're supposed to step off and not jump off. When I jumped off, sort of jumped up, my helmet hit the wing. And because there was nothing holding my feet, and I was just free floating in air, I leaned back um, or I was tilted back from the momentum, from the kinetic energy of hitting that wing. And I remember seeing as I was getting totally disoriented, since I was leaning back, I was looking at the, the airplane flying over me, the one I just fell out of, okay? So the hard arch was not possible. I was out of control and I had um, no orientation at all. Let me tell you, an airplane use ailerons 
to control Rho. They use a rudder to control yaw. They use elevators in the tail to control pitch. Let me tell you, <coughs> pardon me, I had no ailerons, no rudder, no elevators. Kinetic energy to put roll yaw pitch was, put me into an uncontrolled motion because I hit my helmet on the head. My eyes could not fix, uh, focus on a fixed point. The inner ear has what is called the vestibular system for balance. <clears throat> the shift in fluid causes dizziness and can result in passing out. That was the situation I was in. The buffeting wind in my ears confused me because I had no orientation of activity around me. I had no sight, no sound, no orientation, no clarity of thought, just total fear. And the vestibular system was out of whack, so I was about to black out. On average, it takes about one second to fall 200 feet. You will fall 44.1 meters in three seconds. After three more seconds, you have fallen 122 meters. The maximum speed is about 100, 118 miles per hour for a human skydive. That's when it's controlled. But if you are not in control, you have a minimized drag because you're streamlined, because your body's together, and it allows for speeds at about 310 miles per hour. That's not control. So at that moment, you ask how my day's going? I'll tell you how my day's going. It's going about 310 miles per hour. And what do I think the last thing in my mind will be? Probably my feet. And so there's the bird saying, that dear boy, he should flap his wings. Lord, please help that poor boy. Boom. God help me. God gave me the, God did it. I pulled the rip cord in a harrowing escape. And then the bird says, now fly, fly, see like this. <laughs> so I recovered control of roll, yaw, pitch. Everything was reestablished. I was way off course, of, obviously, and I was lost. I was very lost and moving further off course. Remember, I told you about a, a, a zenith 18.4 degree angular vector results in a motion like this going about 16 miles per hour. I was going nearly 16 miles per, per hour plus wind speed to, into dangerous trees and rivers. That's better than the 310 miles per hour I before, and but I had limited control. Um, what actually happened as I started to use the toggles and tried to head back, I actually landed exactly where I was supposed to go. What happens is there's a sand pile that is your target. You're supposed to land on this sand pile. And the reason why is when you hit it, at 16 miles per hour plus wind speed, your feet will sink into the sand. And so what happened was I sunk into the sand as I landed hard, but it was a soft landing because I was in, in the sand pile and my knees bent. And then uh, I said, wow, I made it. And as I stood up, I had 40 pounds on my back. That's the backpack. That's where the parachute was. And that made me whoop, land on my back. It's a crash, but it's a soft landing. The second time I did ground training because the plane was in pieces being repaired. So first of all, I'm using a World War II parachute, a T-10 parachute, and then I'm flying an airplane that they take apart and put together like a Lego set. It's like the neighborhood carnival where they use duct tape to put the roller coaster together for the weekend. The third time, I did jump, but what happened was I missed the sand pile, but my body was used to the sand pile. So when I hit hard ground, it was a hard crash landing. I was used to that sand pile. So I remember that as my feet hit, my butt hit my ankles. I bent my knees, my butt hit my ankles hard and I had nowhere else to go. So then I slammed, I went, rolled over to the right. The motion had to go somewhere. So I crashed on my right. I had a headache for the rest of the day. I had a concussion. So I was injured. It took a while for the fourth attempt to happen. When I landed, I braced for impact and rolled into the downward impact for a softer landing. 
It took four times to get it right, but it took three times to risk my life and nearly dying and getting injured uh, with a concussion and one of the times for me to get it right. So here's the deal. This is the logic. The price of packing a shoot back then, you, you, you don't do it yourself. You hire someone to do it. It's $18. The price of a round trip visit to home to see my mom and dad on the Peter Pan bus lines was $17.50. You see, I could have been with family and actually made 50 cents. I put so much focus on falling out of a plane that I fell out of my purpose. I fell out of focus. Let me tell you, when I called my father to tell him, hey, I can parachute out of a plane, I thought I was really proud of myself. I thought because he was in World War II, he thought it'd be pretty cool. He had a World War II experience and he actually saw the splat factor for real. My father asked me a question. What do you call parachute jumping when the parachute doesn't work? The answer is jumping to a conclusion, the final conclusion. He was so angry. He was so viciously angry at me. I had to hold the phone uh, a distance from my ear. No worries, purpose came fast. My father never had to tell me anything twice. I went back to my studies in mathematics and computer science, and that's how I finished um, my undergraduate studies, not with a parachute. So here's what I learned. While I was jumping, I didn't know my purpose in life. In Jeremiah 29:11. The scripture reads, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. It does not say, for I know the airplanes or the planes for you. It's the plans, not the planes, the plans I have for you. Okay, so here's the suggestion. Let God be the pilot. Roll, as I told you, is when you wiggle. Yaw is when you turn. Pitch is when you go up and down. Let God control your wiggle. Let God set your direction. Let God pull you up if you go down. Let God control your roll, yaw, and pitch. Let God be the pilot. Let God control your wiggle, direction, and pull you up. See, here's what happened. I didn't know there were plans for me. I thought I could make my plans, and obviously I didn't do a good job. I didn't know the plans were to prosper me and not to harm me. I didn't know the plans... Uh, for me gave me hope in a future. You see, I try to be pro prosperous myself. I try to protect myself. I thought I could, could give myself hope. It, it thought I knew that what my future was, my actions. I thought that my actions were what was giving me hope. I didn't know God. I didn't know I had a father God for love and guidance. He had my destiny, but I never asked. I thought danger and excitement was the definition of purpose at that age. And that's why I joined the UMass parachute team. The book of Exodus was the first biblical usage of the name Yahweh. And we can see at the end of the passage that it is the name by which God has chosen to be remembered throughout generations. I didn't know who Yahweh was. Yahweh is the most well-known name for God in the Old Testament. The name Yahweh shows God's covenant lordship over Israel. The Lord revealed this name to Moses at the, begin at the burning bush in the process of calling him to be his agent for liberation uh, of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, an episode recorded in today's passage. You see, God is speaking to Moses through the burning bush and giving him the mission to end all missions, freeing the Israelite people from Egyptian captivity. And here it is in Exodus uh, chapter three, verse 13 through 15. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, uh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And again, that's in Exodus chapter three, verse 13 through 15. You see, Yahweh is the self-existent eternal God. 
Yahweh is a relational God. We have a relationship. Yahweh is with us. Yahweh is the unchanging God. Yahweh is holy other than us. Yahweh keeps his covenant with us. Yahweh is full of mystery, but worth seeking. So picture this at the burning bush. God says, I am Yahweh. And Moses says, no way. God says, Yahweh. See, he was trying to tell us. Some signs you may have an unclear sense of identity are, and compare this to uh, the parachute club at UMass. It's a lack of personal confidence or self uh, worth. The difficulty of accepting both your strengths and your limitations. Being affected by fears, doubts, rejection, or envy. Other people setting your direction. You feel out of place or unfulfilled. Yep, that was me uh, in my undergraduate studies. See, what lies are you telling yourself or allowing to steal away your God-given identity? That is why it's important to know your God-given identity. It not only affects what you believe about yourself, but it also influences the way you live your life. Let's talk about the power of knowing your God-given identity. You gotta be careful about you're not good enough. You're not qualified. You'll never be accepted. You can't change. That's just how you are. You gotta get away from those phrases. So knowing your God-given identity gives you confidence, self-esteem, and awareness. Knowing who you are and who you are changes everything. If you knew that you were fearfully and wonderfully made, as is shown in Psalms 139.14, that would change the way you view yourself. If you knew that your body was a temple, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, maybe you would influence how you would treat it. What if you were aware that you were royalty? And that's in First of Peter, uh, chapter two, verse nine. Would you then boldly re uh, be reigning with God as His daughter or son? What would happen, uh, and what would you do? What would uh, what would your identity based on how God views you? Knowing your God-given identity gives you validation and increases your faith. When you know that God validates you, you're no longer worried about your performance. You know that you're already equipped to do what God is calling you to do. And that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. And you have faith that he will do the work through you. Gone are the days about what other people think or even what you think about yourself. Your faith and hope are no longer based on yourself or others, but by God. Knowing your God-given identity puts you in a better position to understand your purpose. Until you know who you are and whose you are, you're going to have a hard time fully understanding why he created you. You're going to have a hard time understanding your purpose. Your identity and your purpose go hand in hand. Your identity consists of your gifts, talents, education, passions, upbringing, and so much more. All of these factors serve as supporting roles and tools in your purpose. Knowing your God-given identity helps you better understand how they all fit together and what role they play in your purpose and assignment. Here are nine clues to your God-given identity. Here are the nine clues to help you explore who you are uniquely in God. If identity is a struggle for you, I encourage you to take some time to journal or pray about the points you particularly relate to. Think about it. Let's talk about your family identity. In John chapter one, verse 12, the scripture reads, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that's in John chapter one, verse 12. Before you can really fully comprehend your personal identity, you must grasp who you are in God's household. You are royalty. You carry the family DNA and attributes. You are beloved, chosen, and you are the father's son or daughter. You are righteous in Christ. What does God's word say about you and who you are as a son or daughter of God? Think about it. Let's talk about seasons of fulfillment. Can you look back on your life and recognize times and seasons in which you felt the most fulfilled, the most alive? This is not about relationships, but settings, environments. What were you doing during those times? And most importantly, what aspects of your persona and passion were emerging and being revealed during that time? Think about that. Let's talk about the prophetic insights related to you as a person. What scriptures has God used to speak to you personally about your life? 
What prophetic descriptions about who you are have resonated with you? Perhaps you have personal uh, prophecies you can consider as part of the process or personal things. Maybe God has spoken to you uh, directly. We're not considering here promises about what you will do or what God will do. The key is what words and names describe you as a person. How does God see you? Let's now turn our attention to the gifts of people who have believed in you. Throughout your life's journey, God has brought significant people across your path. These are the ones who have believed in you. These people have gifts from God to nourish your identity and help release your potential. Who are they? And what was, what was the best in you that they brought out? What did they see in you that you may have sometimes doubted yourself? Now let's talk about the trials that have brought out the best in you. In Psalms 66.10, the scripture says, For you, God tested us. You refined us like silver. And again, that's in Psalm 66.10. What tests have you undergone that ultimately th brought about something good or strong in you? Can you identify the positive attribute that manifested in your life? How would you describe it? Now let's turn our attention to changing identity. And we can see this in Isaiah 62, 4. That's chapter 62, verse 4. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hepziah. Uh, I said that wrong. Hepziba and your land Bula. And that's in Isaiah 62, 4. See, Moses killed a man and fled Egypt, and his identity was to be a deliverer. But at that time, he was labeled a mur murderer. The enemy hates our identity and the image of God upon us and wants to distort and destroy it. One of the ways he does this is through engineering events that damage our identity and self-worth. Personal failure, circumstances, or mistakes can injure our sense of identity and so can the abuse and rejection of others. If this has taken place in your life, God's plan is to restore your true identity. What markdown label has an event or person inflicted on you? Now, what is the opposite of this? Could you be the true identity that God wants to redeem in your life? Now let's talk about a God-given name. In Isaiah 62.2, the nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the lord will bestow and that's in isaiah 62 2. in the scripture a given name was frequently synonymous with identity in some cases god renamed a person as a sign of their identity and destiny for example jesus renamed simon peter meaning rock and that's in john uh, 1 42. Sometimes today, parents provide their children with a prophetic name that speaks of their identity, but this is not always the case. Is there a name that you have been given by God or others that you believe is a prophetic for your life and describes who you are? Now let's talk about who are you when fearless. If fear and doubts are not an issue, who would you be? Think of that. What attributes would be displayed in your life? What is the best version of you, not other people's version of what you should be? Think of what is the best version of you. And next, let's talk about what is your unique sense of passion and purpose. Your interest and the things that you are passionate about are an important part of who you are. You may even have a sense of destiny or call of God. This is also a clue to your identity. In Gideon's destiny, Gideon's destiny, I should say, was uh, to lead the Israelites in battle and lead the nation to God. God addressed him by his identity, mighty warrior. And that's in Judges chapter 6, verse 12. Abraham's destiny was to birth a lineage. God uh, named him Abraham, which meant father of a multitude. And that's in Genesis chapter 7, verse 4 through 6. So the question you ask is, do I have a sense of particular purpose or have I got a glimpse of God's call on my life? Working backwards, what does this say about how God sees me and who he has created me to be? In other words, what's my calling? Your identity is like a crystal that when held to the light reflects many facets and colors. 
you do not have to come up with a single name or description, although you may have one that stands out and sums up the other attributes. It's okay to still be uncertain. Give yourself the freedom to explore what this means as you live your life with God. Your God-given identity will continue to emerge and become clearer over time. So in summary, I talked about the nine clues to your God-given identity. We talked about number one, your family identity. Number two, seasons of fulfillment. Number three, prophetic insights related to you as a person. Number four, gifts of people who have believed in you. Number five, trials that have brought out the best in you. Number six, changing identity. Number seven, a God-given name. And number eight, who are you when fearless? Now let's turn our attention to the five steps to find your God-given purpose in life. There are five of them. One, turn to the Bible. Two, pray for direction. Three, follow the will of God. Four, promises of God. And five, living a purpose-driven life. So let me look at number one. God has left us with a wealth of knowledge of the Bible to help us. See, we should turn to the Bible. I'm sharing knowledge that has been revealed to me through my personal lessons in life. I must admit, I don't have all the answers, but I can point uh, you to the source that can help you find your God-given purpose. I believe to live a life with both passion and purpose, we must continue to learn who Jesus Christ is and what he says our purpose in life is. Number two, pray for direction. I often meditate and pray each morning using the, the using different apps and different, um, well, I, I listen to music. Um, I, I pray with my wife. Um, and this is to attain peace and gain a sense of direction before um, I continue the rest of my day. See, I have faith that my, that my work will touch someone else's life and allow them to gain knowledge that changes their outlook. With this task, I take on a huge burden, so I pray for the ability to articulate my words to people in a way that is most help helpful. As you see your purpose, understand that each day as we live is a gift and ask how much, how to make the most of the day by living by faith and not by sight. Number three, follow the will of God. For us to live with God, uh, a God-given purpose, you must first put down this life to gain life. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And that's in Proverbs 19, 21. Uh, God has better plans for us than we can imagine. He does things which we may not be able to understand, but trust in his will. Through scripture, there are several ways we can live a purpose-driven life. And in 1 John chapter 13, verse 20 through 21, the scripture reads, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So you see, take time and reflect. If you feel you desire materialistic possessions or want pride and power, it's futile to focus on temporary pleasures because on our deathbed, we can't take anything with us. Besides, more than likely, your family will be by your bedside and they love you unconditionally, not because of what you have. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the scripture says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And next, the promises of God. Now that we understand what the will of God is for our life, we must look at the many promises of God when we seek our first kingdom of God. There are over 3,000 promises of God, but I want to point out a few that are related specifically to finding your God-given purpose in life so that you can experience um, a career or a home life that aligns with your faith. In Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, they are the plans for good and not for a disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In Romans 8, uh, verse 28 through 29, in all things God works for the good and of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, which is to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And in James chapter 1, verse 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Number five, living a purpose-driven life. 
Once we learn to live a life that's Christ-centered, then we understand how we can glorify God in all things. In this way, we can lead a purpose-driven life for God. I was lost, not seeking worldly things like money, power, and status, but felt that they were trivial because long-term, they didn't matter. I knew we must face death, so I decided to serve a purpose that's bigger than myself. We all want to leave a legacy, but I asked myself, how can I do that in a way that can truly make an impact on others in other people's lives? You know, Rick Warren uh, wrote uh, The Purpose Driven Life. In, in it, Rick talks about the God's intentions to use our talents to do good in the world and explains God's five purposes for us. And there are five of them. Um, we, number one, we were playing for God's pleasure. So your first purpose is to offer real worship. Number two, we were formed for God's family. So your second purpose is to enjoy real fellowship. Number three, we were created to become like Christ. So your third purpose is to learn real discipleship. Number four, we were shaped for serving God. So your fourth purpose is to practice real ministry. Number five, we were made for a mission. So your fifth purpose is to live out real evangelism. So there, here are the five steps to find your God-given purpose in life. Number one, turn to the Bible. Number two, pray for direction. Number three, follow the will of God. Number four, the promises of God. And number five, living a purpose-driven life. So let God be the pilot. Let God use others to help you as well. There was a man who fell in the ocean and he couldn't swim. When a boat came by, the captain yelled, do you need help, sir? The man calmly said, no, God will save me. A little later, another boat came by and a fisherman asked, hey, do you need help? The man replied again, no, God will save me. Eventually the man drowned and went to heaven. The man asked God, why didn't you save me? God replied, fool, I sent you two boats. So what have we talked about today? We've talked about a lot of things. Um, in summary, we talked about number one, the testimony about identity and purpose in life. That's number one. Number two, let God control your wiggle direction and pull you up. Number three, learn who Yahweh is. Number four, the signs of unclear identity in life. Number five, what your God-given identity gives you. Number six, clues to your God-given identity. Number seven, God-given purpose in life. Number eight, how to let God be the pilot in your life. Number nine, your identity is your God-given purpose. And that brings us to the end of my conversation with you today. My name is David Ewan. I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. You can check out our website, resurrectionspringfield.org. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.